Yes, get up there and act professional. Yeah, that's what I am. I'm just trying to get a little <laughs> bit more decorating. You know. All right, I think everything works. We are officially live here at VandySports.com. We are doing a live uh, broadcast, you know, which is something we don't do a lot, um, but something uh, hopefully we'll do a little bit more of, you know, since, uh, you know, we robbed some people and we got Justin Angel back in the phone and we could pay mm-hmm. him a little bit more, you know, so uh, – <laughs> So is yeah, this uh, Andy Sports first here with the live? Well, no, Chris has done live chats with like Bruno and stuff post game. So okay, he's done a lot of post game live stuff, and uh, I can only imagine what the comments look like. Now. I did, yeah, <laughs> I did, I did one. <laughs> Real buzz. I did, I did one with him uh, after signing day last year as well. So not not a first, but a first for me and you uh, to do a yeah. live stream. So. So here we are. Uh, we've got four people in so far. So maybe more people will come in. Hey, who knows? I don't know. But with live oh, streams. fired up about that Cowboys-Titans game. <laughs> well, when the Titans are playing all their backups. <laughs> yeah, they're going to get after it. Yeah, right. So we uh, we got uh, Cameron Gad anchored down. He is here hanging out. So appreciate you guys uh, hanging out. And, uh, hey, if you got any questions about Vanderbilt's 2023 football recruiting class, or the players they've signed so far in, during part one of the early signing period, just hit us up on uh, YouTube. And we also had some questions on our message board as well. Uh, hopefully you got those pulled up, Justin, and we can answer those eventually. So uh, right. obviously Sean Williams here, Justin Angel, part of the VanitySports.com crew. Uh, we are over a thousand subscribers, which is awesome. So hopefully when people, uh, you know, when people watch this and, and they're watching it, well, uh, we don't lose subscribers for Chris Lee because that would, you know, that would be pretty terrible. So, right. <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> Sorry, dude. I, I was uh, I was focused on something else. So. <laughs> what are you watching? <laughs> I ain't watching anything. I don't think I don't think you had the recruiting class pulled up. I think you're watching. No, I got pulled up now. I'm ready. Yeah, so well, I'm like, getting into all the star stuff start off here. I'm just I'm watching. You, you watching Pornhub or something? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Scott Derrick's here, anchored down, so he's excited to, uh, I guess, listen to our show, listen to our thoughts about Vanderbilt's 2023 signing class, and uh, yeah, we'll just start off uh, there. Um, obviously, early signing period last week, we have done a lot of stories on those. Eighty percent or ninety percent of those stories were from Justin Angel, so <laughs> feel free. To- yeah, I really, knew, I, like I said, though, the majority of it was in about one day at work. I just was able to spread right. it out, you know, once I got those interviews, especially with the assistant coaches. So that helped out just a little bit. Yeah, assistant coach interviews, um, did some coach analysis pieces, which are really informative. Um, so if you want to check all that out, uh, go to VandySports.com. It's all on the front page, and uh, you can kind of go through and look at that stuff. And, uh, yeah, feel free to subscribe to VandySports.com as well. So, Great, uh, great site. Been a part of it for a while. So, yeah. Cool. So, uh, yeah, 2023 class, 20 signees for Vanderbilt so far. This is part one, obviously, the early signing period in December. Uh, 20 signees for Vanderbilt. They are currently ranked 44th nationally, according to Rivals.com. Uh, Justin, kind of overall thoughts on this recruiting class, um, I guess maybe positives, negatives, things like that. Well, the positives is Vanderbilt needed some skill talent on offense. And I think, you know, with the free receivers that they got, free running backs that they got, which we're going to talk about quite a bit, uh, that is something they definitely needed. And, you know, and something they always talked about, you know, from talking to those assistant coaches the other day and asking them that kind of the general theme throughout all that was, you know, we need more speed. We need to add more speed. You know, we felt like, you know, some of those plays for 10, 12, 15 yard gains that we thought we could have took the top off and, you know, been a touchdown. But because the lack of speed there, they weren't able to do those things. So that was something they tried to address in this class. And, you know, honestly, I'm very impressed with what they did as far as wide receiver you know, running back, those two. And that's really the two that they needed help in, you know, I, they took three running backs. You know, there was a talking about there at the time, you know, whether they would take a transfer or not mm-hmm. uh, to, to be in there. But 
if they're going to get high school backs, I, I definitely think that you got three there that can contribute uh, early and something that, you know, you look at uh, the running back for Ole Miss, what's his last name, Judkins, is that what he is? You know? Uh, yeah, Judkins. Yeah. yeah, how much success he had as a true freshman. I mean, and he wasn't just a just extremely highly recruited guy. You know, he was highly recruited, but I'm not saying like he wasn't a five star guy. Uh, so, you know, you can have success with uh, skill talent as far as the true freshman and those things. And, you know, defensively, uh, they were able to add two big defensive linemen that, uh, you know, and that, that's that's always been a tough thing for Vanderbilt to do. You know, Sean, the, the time that you've covered Vanderbilt, you know, we used to always talk about. That, you know, we just don't understand they can't get those type of defensive linemen. Right. I mean, me and you used to always say they need to just go up in the Midwest and just get them two old guys that you're usually playing the Mac and just play extremely <laughs> hard and just finally just get them in there and go. You know, I, I still think that's a sound strategy you can do, though. <laughs> but I don't. Well, that, get- that was what me and you came up with because it just seemed like they could not recruit defensive linemen, you know, right. at SEC caliber. And, uh, you know, the, the Demarion Thomas they got from Oklahoma, uh, you know, somebody we'll get into talk about. I mean, I was very impressed with his film. Uh, and, uh, you know, somebody that they got listed at 330 pounds. So I don't know if he's really that big. Uh, <laughs> if they put 330, surely he is. You well, know, uh, I think, uh, I think, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll have to look and see that. We got him at 307 right now. I don't know if I, yeah. I don't know if he has so I don't know on his official yeah. visit if he weighed 330 pounds or what, but <laughs> if you watch his, uh, you know, and I watched some of his game film, the thing about it is, you know, he's he's a single digit, which, you know, always gets people fired up. You see a big defensive lineman in single digit, you know, that just, you know, you, your focus goes to there every single time. Does but, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely it does. Yes. All defensive linemen want to wear a single digit. I mean, everybody does. Um, but, um, you know, his ability to run to the football and do those things, I mean, that's impressive for a guy that weighs that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then linebacker-wise, uh, the thing that they talked about, you know, in those coaches' pieces that we did, uh, they talked about position versatility with those linebackers. You know, Chris, Kelly, um, right. the other one, Ruth, that they just got. You know, all of them's got position versatility where they can move around and bounce around. And then uh, in the secondary, they only got two guys. It's because last year they signed six. So, you know, they didn't need a huge <laughs> amount of those. But uh, maybe the best guy in the entire class and Martel Hyde. So, um, you know, I, I think it's not flashy. Uh, I know it didn't end the way that a lot of people wanted it to. You know, people look at that where they lost Pampton, they lost Lanier, they're late. They're just like, you know, yeah, it's not very good. And, you know, that put a little damper on it. But in the grand scheme of things, I think when you look at it, offensive skill talent is what they needed. And I think you're going to have some guys that are going to make an instant impact, you know. Right. And that's the thing with Swan, him at quarterback, you know, uh, his supporting cast this year, and that's not saying anything bad about those guys. It wasn't great. You know, I thought Ray Davis was a really good football player. Um, <clears throat> he had two pretty good, two decent tight ends there with Bresnahan and, and Sean Wall. But on the outside, you didn't have many proven weapons whatsoever. You know, Shepard was really the only guy coming into the year that had done anything. Uh, right. And then you got McGowan and Skinner that flashed throughout the year. All right, and then you got Jamarian Carter come on and made a couple of plays. But, I mean, they need skill, talent, you know, for that offense to, to take the jump that you that you want it to. You know, and offensive line-wise, they got all those guys coming back this next year. Uh, so that puts those running backs in a decent situation. You know, they're not walking in there, you know, with three brand-new starters on the offensive line and having to deal with that, you know, because if you, we were talking about that right now, it'd be a whole different story. Okay. All right. Yeah. But these running backs, you know, they're walking into a decent situation. Yeah. I think the running back, I mean, the running back room is kind of the story of uh, maybe the story of the class, you know, and, and, you know, we can probably flip that on the, and maybe say, well, the ending wasn't as good as expected when you had Pimpton Lee, but we'll start with the running backs. It's more of a positive just because, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, they're sitting there at two, right. 
And then, you know, we were like, oh, who's that third one going to be? They brought in Benson, and, you know, he was kind of on the fence of whether he wanted to, uh, you know, sign early or wait till February. And, right. uh, you know, it was kind of like, well, you know, would it make more sense to sign a transfer running back? I guess to us it, it did, but to Clark Lee and his staff, they were pretty comfortable with taking three guys. And I, right. you know, kind of get your perspective on that. I mean, do you think that's a right move to bring in three uh, high school running backs? I mean, obviously they need the bodies there considering what happened this past year. Yes. You know, you're, you're, you're you know, you kind of, you know, showing guys the door, Rocco Griffin, you know, uh, decides to transfer out and you lose Ray Davis to the transfer portal. So they definitely needed some bodies there. But do you think that was the right move to go with three high school guys? Well, it's not up to me, but, you know, my, <laughs> <laughs> my personal opinion would be get an older guy and bring him in and do those things, you know, but uh, I agree with you. I mean, you, I, but when you get in the transfer portal, the majority of the guys are in there for one reason. They want more playing time. Money. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) some of them are in there for money. 80% of them are in there because they want more playing time. That's why they're in there. So, and uh, if you're really wanting a competition at that position and you're not wanting to be the, you know, the workhorse, give it to someone like Ray Davis over and over and over again, uh, then going with three freshmen is probably the route to go. Um, uh, and also too, uh, you know, uh, if you remember on the board, you know, they told Jordan Louie, who was a four-star bag that they were full yeah. and, you know, he went on and ended up picking between North Carolina and West Virginia, which I'm pretty sure he went to North Carolina. Yeah. Um, uh, but the reason that they were able to get a AJ Newberry and a Diego, Diego Benson was because they offered early playing time, you know, and I was able to talk to both of those guys after they committed and both of them mentioned that specifically, that that was one of the reasons that, you know, they chose Vanderbilt. And, you know, if you get an opportunity to come in playing the Southeastern conference year one, all right, you know, they, they, they like to hear that. So, uh, and if you're giving them that, that opportunity and, and like I said earlier, you know, the fact that they have, uh, the offensive lineman that they have coming back, that makes that uh, much more possible. You know, if, if if you don't have that up front, uh, then it's going to be tough, you know, so. Yeah, I think the, the skill set of these running backs is uh, pretty versatile. I mean, everybody kind of brings something a little bit different, which is good, you know, and you got Patrick Smith coming back. You've got Chase Gillespie on the roster, but you have these three guys that, you know, are a little bit different. I mean, I think I think people expect Cedric Alexander to kind of play right away because he's the early enrollee, but I think between me and you, and we've discussed this, may not – be the most impactful guy that we see at a uh, the three. I think, I think we kind of like, we both kind of like AJ Newberry a little bit more than the rest. And that's for a lot of reasons. Uh, his, you know, he's big, he's fast, you know, he's that home run hitter guy. He plays in like a spread style offense in high school. So I think he'll right. adapt really well. He, he pat, you know, he, pass pro you know he pass protects so that's that's very helpful that'll get you on the field you know you got dago benson who's you know playing like a flex bone wishbone triple option offense so how you know that adjustment period might be a little bit different for him so yeah we kind of see aj newberry being a guy that might be the biggest splash among these three that are coming in right and one thing about all three of them too and and they talked about this when i was talking to joey lynch was you know the the ability to catch out of the backfield. I think all three are able to do that. Right. Uh, when I talked to Diego Benson's coach, he said that he thought he could line up in the slot and play out there if he wanted to. So, uh, you know, they, they can do all of those things. Uh, but like you said, I mean, just to piggyback that, you know, just m- my personal opinion watching them, uh, just A.J. Newberry looks like he's the real deal, you know, and he ran for 1,700 yards. He's productive. You know, that's something that, to me, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, when I'm looking at running backs, I want guys that are productive, you know, because if you're a Southeastern conference running back and you're playing in high school, I don't care if you got me and Sean lined up at guard in front of you, you should be gaining some yards. I mean, that's just, that's how it is, you know, and uh, as an old offensive lineman, I know, you know, a good running back is your best friend, you know, sometimes right. he can make you look a whole lot better than what you really are. And, um, you know, AJ Newberry, he's got, He's got that next gear and do those things, you know. And you talk about Diego Benson, you know, he is a big, 
fast guy. You know, he's the fastest of the three that they got. Uh, but like you said, he plays in the triple option. The one thing about that is if he is playing in the triple option, he's having a block if he's playing out there wing. You know, those right, guys, right. when they're running, they're not running it to their side, they're blocking. Now, he's not pass protecting. He's not doing those things. But he is having to get out there and block and do all of those things. Uh, and then, you know, you talk about Cedric Alexander, super productive, absolutely super productive. Um, gained a whole lot of yards, but he's not going to be your home run hitter by any stretch. You know, he's a little more short, compact. He's going to break some tackles and do those things. And, you know, uh, he kind of reminds me a little bit of like Jaron Seymour from back in the day. You know, uh, that's blast from the past there. But he, he was really short, which Cedric ain't – he's not as short as what Jaron Seymour was. But he's just going to be the type that gets caught up in there behind and he's going to be able to get some yardage and good vision and those type things. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think A.J. Newberry is the uh, – to me – going to be the most impactful. The only thing is Cedric Alexander is going to get the step up above everybody else because he's going to be there in January. Right. right. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, the thing about, uh, about these, uh, having these uh, live streams. So, you know, you can always project and predict. Right. You having an echo on your end? No, I'm good. Okay, maybe it's just me then. That's why I hesitated there for a second. Am I echoing bad? No, you're good. I heard oh. myself. That 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 bothered no, me. Uh, you're, yeah. you're not going. Okay, good. Hopefully, I don't scare anybody else on this live stream that's with us. So, appreciate Justin Holland for the uh, comments. Um, he did say Sean at left tackle when we were. You mentioned that <laughs> if we were playing offensive line, <laughs> <laughs> if I played left tackle, I'd have to have some padding on my ass because that's where I'd be most of the time. So. Hey, cut blocking is legal. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you just you can't show anything else. You can't like pass protect and then go into it. If you're going to cut, you got to do it right <laughs> off the bat. So we hope that there's a defensive lineman sitting right So I'll, I'll just be on all fours a lot. Because Correct. <laughs> yes. Sacrifice your body. Well, that sounds like an R rated movie right there, my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Justin Holland says, uh, Can we get some class superlatives, please? I, I, I don't know if you want to kind of do that later, Justin, but we'll probably I guess eventually get to that we we kind of went through and did like a class impact uh story uh recently I wrote it but yeah I got a lot of impact from you Justin we can maybe talk about that later if you want to talk about it now we can what do you want to do I, I mean I'm good with it whatever, whatever you want to do all right instant impact guys uh let's just do that um I th you know we all we already kind of mentioned AJ Newberry is a guy that we think will kind of be a splash guy whenever he gets there and now you mentioned Cedric Alexander among the running backs will be there early so that'll help him out um what were oh, obviously uh <laughs> you know instant impact guys we had Brock Taylor the kicker because you know, you're losing you know below us this year so um right. You know who's going to come in? Maybe they address that in the transfer portal. We don't know that yet, but right now it looks like he's got a prime opportunity to be a starting kicker uh, yes. next year. So we'll see how that kind of plays out. Uh, other instant impact guys for you. I think we both agree that uh, the first name that rolls off our tongue, aside from AJ Newberry, is Maurice Sherrill. Yes, Junior Sherrill. Yes, as when you're talking about instant impact, I think that's a guy that's going to play a lot as a true freshman. Uh, just, I mean, if you look at what he did when he was at Lipscomb Academy and, and, you know, and you, you understand this when you watch Lipscomb, I mean, they got day one guys running around everywhere, but I think if you take him off that team, it greatly affects how they play. You know, if you watch the state championship game against CPA, it honestly looked like if you took junior off the, the field, that that game would have been more competitive, but you know, he was doing everything as far as playing running back, playing wide receiver, you know, kick returner, doing all of those things. And uh, Vanderbilt this past year, just like we talked about, they, they didn't play a ton of receivers. And I, I don't think that was because they just want to play the same guys over and over again. I just don't think that they had the depth that they liked at the wide receiver position. So, you know, I think Junior Sherrill and his skill set – and some of the things that he's going to be able to do, he can run jet sweeps. He can be a guy that, you know, kind of works the middle of the field and do some of those things, you know, kind of similar to Jaden McGowan. 
he's not the speed of Jaden McGowan, but probably more of a true receiver at times, you know, and, and do some of those things. I, I think he, out of all, is probably has the best chance at an instant impact. Yeah, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned in the in the write up, you know, you want a guy that that you know has speed, has versatility, and is kind of electric when the ball's in his hands. And Vanderbilt definitely desperately needs more of those guys on the field on offense. And uh, I think that's just kind of why, um, you know, kind of see him on being on the field a lot next year as a true freshman, making plays for uh, for the Commodores in the passing game. And you know, he's a guy you can throw, you know, jet sweep him, uh, you know, line him up in the backfield, give him. Give him, a, give him a few carries too, you know, just kind of mix it up. He's kind of one of those versatile guys that can be a can be a player. I think another guy we've we mentioned, at least in the articles, Martel Height. You kind of mentioned that earlier. Might be the best uh, best defensive guy in the class, uh, right. just in terms of skill set and versatility and everything like that. I mean, just uh, kind of talk about Martel Height. Your uh, thoughts on him? Well, Height is a guy that you know he 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 plays safety at Rome, uh, but you know that talking to Dan Jackson, he was talking about that. He said, you know, and, and this is kind of the scenario that we have, we've always encountered when in high school is if you put your best player at corner, that other corner better be really good because they're going to throw it at him every single time. That's where they're going with the football. So if you're doing that, then you're pretty much taking away whoever your best player is at that position. So it just makes sense to put him at safety and let him go from there, you know, and, that, and that's what they did with Martel Hyatt. And if you watch him, he does everything. Uh, he's playing offense. He's playing defense. Uh, he's the punter. Uh, he's the return guy. I mean, he's doing everything. He might even call be the part-time offensive coordinator. You never know. Okay. All right. But he's doing it all. <laughs> and uh, when you get somebody like him that's playing at such a high level in defense when he's playing all the time, just imagine how good he's going to be once he just plays his – position that he's going to play and you know Vanderbilt's had their struggles at corner over the past few years uh he just I see him as a guy that could definitely make an instant impact as well uh, you know but I'm not going to go full all in on that uh like I am with Junior Cheryl uh because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that because last year we were kind of saying the same thing with all the DBs that they got and you know, we were saying, hey, here we go, here we go. And then pretty much the only guy out of was Richard, yeah. and who we thought was the best one that they had <laughs> coming in. But we, I sure as heck didn't think he was going to be playing corner. You know, I, you know, I thought he was going to be a safety and doing those things and, and all that. So, you know, I'm not going to go full all out and say, hey, he's going to be, but he has the ability to do so. So. Yeah, I think that's a little bit of a different position, especially when, you know, they brought in so many DBs last year, and you mentioned only one got, like, significant snaps, and it wasn't, you know, a whole lot of playing time, but he got some. But, yeah, it's going to vary by position. Do we think these running backs, at least one or two of these freshman running backs, see a lot of time or get a lot of reps? Yeah, we probably think so. It's the depth chart, you know. Yes. Uh, so that has a lot to play with, a lot of, a lot to play with it, too. Um Another guy that was on our list was uh, Cameron Johnson. And, uh, you know, obviously he's listed as a wide receiver, but he's being recruited as a tight end, and that's why we had him on the list. And, look, you know, you mentioned Showmall and uh, Bresnahan, but, you know, Vanderbilt didn't throw the ball a lot to tight ends this year. And, you know, I don't know if that was by design or maybe there's a lack of pass catching skills there. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. But we think that, you know, he can probably see the field pretty early just based on, uh, you know, just based on his skill set and his ability to go up and high point the ball and beat people one-on-one, -on -one, so. Right, and pretty much only a tight end right now. you got Justin Ball and Cole Spence, and that's it. So, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I, I think, you know, the transfer portal-wise, when the windows come open in the spring, I definitely think that that would be a position that they'll go after there. But, you know, Cam Johnson, he's one of your big-bodied wide receivers that they're going to convert to more of your flex tied in, uh, you know. And, and in today's game, and this is something I put on the uh, put on the board, you know, in today's game where so many teams are spread offenses, they're playing really, really fast, you know, 
teams have had to start to recruit like that. You no longer have the 240-pound, 45-pound middle linebacker that's just running downhill, taking on ISO anymore. Right. Because if you do that, you're just going to throw RPO right off the back on a little slant, and there it goes. Okay, so what to, what's ended up happening is, is the majority of your defensive backs is pretty much like they play with four corners now, like two corners, two corners playing at safety, and then now you got safety types that are playing linebacker. And, you know, and it's just they got faster, but they've also got a little bit smaller during that time. And, and so if you take that and you get a big body like Cam Johnson uh, and he's able to put on a little bit of weight, that makes a, you know, it's a mismatch for your smaller safeties, mismatch for your linebackers that aren't as athletic that can't do those things. And, you know, and, and talking about that, guys being more athletic on defense, which I know we're talking about signees here, but that's one of the things I always thought that made Orgy a really good linebacker was the fact that, you know, he played safety in high school the entire time. Right. And, you know, and, <laughs> and when, he got, when they signed him, you know, there was a lot of people, oh, he's going to play safety, he's going to play safety. Well, he can be play safety and be, you know, average athleticism there, or he can go and play uh, linebacker and be super athletic there and be able to do those things. So, yeah. uh, but, you know, Cam Johnson, if he's able to put the weight on, you know, they were all talking about his, the way that he uh, performed in count and how, you know, he went eight for eight that day, and they just kept throwing him out there, kept throwing him out there, trying to hope that, hey, you know, maybe this guy doesn't look as good. And every single time he proved him wrong and kept making play after play after play. So I don't know if I can look that up real quick, but I do remember talking to Cameron Johnson after he committed, and he said, yeah, I went to camp. They lined me up at wide receiver. I dominated. They put me at tight end. I dominated. <laughs> 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 it was pretty classic confident uh confident quotes there i think well if you're going eight for eight you're uh you're uh yeah you're so yeah. He, he, yeah. he wasn't lying yeah i think we had uh we had Diego benson on the list as well so i mean it probably to rate all those instant impact guys that we think will make an instant impact next year i think probably junior Cheryl's number one i would agree with that yes followed by Dewberry, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay. That, that's good. Um, that's good. Um, Martel Hyde, and you know, and, and when we talked about this too, and I know people put it on the board and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we talked about London Humphreys. Right. He could be a. He could definitely make so a. Fast. You yeah. can definitely make a splash in special teams, you know. You can make a splash in special teams, and you can also tell him to go out there and run a post route, run right. a go route, and run it as fast as you possibly can. And at some point, you know, they can throw one up and do whatever they got to do there. And then the other one we talked about was Demarion Thomas. Right. You know, and he, he, he has a shot. But we were hesitant on putting any type of lineman in there because that is so hard to do right. in the Southeastern Conference. You know, yeah. even they, they get five-star guys that come in that aren't physically ready to go against – 2021 now in the COVID area era 26 24, year old. <laughs> all right that's playing the, their eighth year of college football all right so <laughs> so that's why we didn't go that route right. but if you were going to get one of those defensive linemen to play Demarion Thomas would definitely be that guy whether he's 307 or 330 you know they might have given a 25 one. Well, I can tell you what not, they might have a 25 I was, I watched one of his games just so I could see just, you know, how he was. And and I told you after I watched it, I, I felt bad for that guard that was playing against him because they kept <laughs> running ISO over at him, and he was just <laughs> – <laughs> and that poor guy stood zero shot of blocking him. And then when he's playing hard and running to the football the way that he is, you know, that, that's, that's not real fun. So – yeah, whether he might, maybe he's three thirty, maybe they had him with a twenty five pound weight during his official visit while he's on the weight scale. <laughs> well, they probably fed him about six times a day, and they probably <laughs> weighed him at the end of it. Yeah, there you go. There yeah, you go. that's how you do it. Uh, <laughs> all right, so that takes care of the superlatives part. So we answered uh, Justin Holland's question, which we. You know, we had a well, we had a story about what we can talk about a little bit more in depth and, and guys that we didn't include that we thought about including. So 
we didn't want to, you know, throw with 10 dudes on there because, you know, you never know how that plays out. Well, so. if you're going superlative, and this is for you, Sean, I'll ask you a question here. All right. Nope. Sleeper in the class. <laughs> Sleeper. Sleeper. Uh, dude, that's a great question. Um, Probably, I don't know, let's just go with uh, the linebacker, Jalen Ruth. I mean, he's okay. long, he's fast. You know, I mean, he's kind of the late, the late ad. Uh, I don't think we talk a lot about him. I know he played like, you know, he plays like small, you know, kind of in a smaller classification in Florida. So, well, he but, was recently named Class One A Player of the Year. Yeah, Florida. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think he could be a guy that could pop on the map and and play some next year. And you know, and we say instant impact. We're not, you know, we're not. <laughs> our our version of instant impact is hey, you get some reps on the field. You, you know you're playing in a majority of the games, uh, depending on how many snaps you get. That's another story. I mean, but but yeah, I think uh, that would be a sleeper. Uh, what do you got? You got a sleeper? I'm going Dante Kelly from Mississippi. Well, that, yeah, I was thinking about him too. Yeah, so. even though he you know at one time Mississippi State commit, uh, we were told him. Mississippi State never stopped recruiting him. So after he decommitted there for a little bit, they still stayed after him. Vanderbilt was able to go into Mississippi and get him. You know, that's 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 a big deal. You know, right. uh, schools in that state like him. They've evaluated him because they're the ones that see him the most. Right. Uh, you know, and that that was the thing with Misa Sandoval. Uh, you know, he didn't have a ton of offers, but to me, it was a positive that he had an offer from San Diego State. Yeah. Why is that? Because, you know, he's from San Diego. They're there. They see him all the time. You know, they're around that school. They, they do those things. So, but Dante Kelly, uh, just really athletic. Um, I do think there will be some transition there for him. I don't know how quick of an impact he'll make, uh, but you can definitely see the athleticism on his tape. You know, he just seems to be instinctual. He just seems to be around the football all the time. And he does a bunch of different stuff. Like he doesn't, you know, he's got a pretty good skill set of where, you know, coverage, he can blitz, he can do, you know, all of this stuff that he's able to do. And and once you're able to do that, that only helps. And he's got the big frame and uh, I think he can be a guy that's pretty good eventually. Yeah. I mean, so you're including him as one of your sleepers. Yeah, I'm going sleeper there. <laughs> okay, um, that that will kind of be a smooth transition because I was going to ask you about like just some other uh, positions in this class, and obviously, you know, we're talking about positions uh, that Vanderbilt kind of, you know, signed a lot of, and offensive lines one of them. You know, I mean, they had uh, four offensive line signees. So uh, you mentioned Sandoval. Uh, what's kind of your overall thought process on the offensive linemen they signed in the class, and and what do you like about each of those guys? Well, they signed four, and in just watching their film and stuff, you could tell Sandoval, he plays tackle in high school. He can't play tackle in college uh, just from a – he doesn't move well enough to do that. Uh, so you know he's going to be an interior guy. Cooper Starks is definitely an interior guy. Barrett Maddox, you watch him. He's, he's a tackle. Uh, that's what he does. And then when I watched Anthony Miles, I was like, you know what? He, he looks like he could play interior or he could possibly play tackle. Uh, but talking to uh, talking to Coach Blazic, you know, he, he, they see uh, Miles as a true offensive tackle. So, so when you look at that, they've got two, uh, two tackles. They've got two interior guys. Uh, and, you know, when I was talking to Chris Lee, you know, talking about these interior guys, they're just – they're large humans, and they're big dudes. And sometimes you don't have to be just incredibly athletic uh, to be a solid interior offensive lineman as long as you're strong. You know, you got to have some athleticism. I'm not saying that. But if you're just big, that is something that helps. And you're talking about two guys – you know, Mesa coming in, he's 6'6", about 318 pounds right now. Cooper Stark, 6'5", 320 pounds, throws the uh, shot put like like no other. Uh, so those are two big-bodied guys, you know, and, and they compared them to, uh, <clears throat> to the offensive lineman. Uh, Castillo that they got a couple of years ago, who he came in, he's about 340 pounds. 
you know, <laughs> when I was watching his film, I saw her just fist pumping, just fired up because he was pulling everything else and just getting after people. And just as an offensive line, it's like, it's fantastic. But uh, Misa, his film is pretty solid, and I like it. Cooper Starks, big body. And then you got, you know, Barrett Maddox and uh, and Miles. You know, Miles is a guy that they were in on early. Mm-hmm. Mississippi State was after him. Missouri was after him. Yeah, yeah, so you're beating, out, you're beating Southeastern Conference programs out for them. And you got Barrett Maddox, who was a little bit of a late bloomer, you know, but he had offers from UCLA and right. Kansas. And, and, and one of my thing is I, I always think that Vanderbilt does a good job sometimes when they get underrated Tennessee linemen. Just they've had a history of producing quality offensive linemen that were not just highly recruited, but guys that they were able to get out of their own backyard and, you know, were able to come in and be really good players. One of those were, was Joe Townsend. You know, Joe Townsend picked Vanderbilt over MTSU on signing day. You know, and people were on there going, I can't believe we got this guy, you know. <laughs> it's late signing and everything. Well, I had coached against the guy. I knew that he was he, he was a real deal. I mean, and he was actually thought of himself as a defensive lineman at that time. But he ended up having a really good career down there in Vanderbilt. And I think you can get some of those guys from the state of Tennessee, especially offensive linemen. And, you know, and some as me and you were talking about the other day, you know, the 2024 class in state wise has a ton of offensive linemen in it. So, but loaded. Loaded. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, you know, Vanderbilt's after a lot of those guys, which, mm-hmm. you know, which they should be. But, you know, just Barrett Maddox. Uh, just watching him, I mean, it's not hard to pick him out that he's a Southeastern Conference type body. I mean, he's legit 6'5", 6'6", about 280 pounds, and he is athletic. So, you know, it's uh, from a offensive line standpoint, I mean, I, I think it's a solid play, especially from the body types they were able to get. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Perk says agree on Dante Kelly uh, among your sleeper picks. Reminds me of C.J. Taylor. That's a big, uh, nice comparison there. Nice comparison. Maybe he lives up to C.J. Taylor. We'll see. That's going to be hard to do. Hey, C.J. Taylor, another in-state guy that <laughs> might have been lightly recruited that's working out pretty well for Vanderbilt. C.J. Right Taylor. If anybody had watched him play in high school, he would not have been a three-star. I can tell you that much. He just happened to be playing at Warren County. No offense to Warren County. No, you know, it's, it's they've totally had some good true. players up there. I mean, they've sent some guys to the Southeastern Conference recently, so it's not like you know it's the the first. But it's totally yeah. true, though. I mean, you know, like it, it would he would be a lot different, and he'd probably get a lot more. You know, he would probably get a lot more exposure. You know, quote unquote, if he was playing in Metro Nashville. You know, but you know, those, those kids that are playing out there in you know the Boondocks, they're you know, they might have some power five offers, but, you know, maybe they get them at camp and then, you know, they kind of get forgotten about or something like that, right. you know. And, Which he did. He got one from Mississippi State there pretty early. Right. And then he really didn't hear much from them after that. But C.J. Taylor, just the things that he was able to do offensively and defensively and do it in pretty much, you know, the best 6A region in, in the state and taking Warren County and beating those guys – it was unreal. So, but, uh, you know, the, the knock on him at the time was, well, he's, he's uh, too small to play linebacker and he's not fast enough to play safety. And then here we are two or three years later and he's second team all SEC. So, <laughs> well, I mean, if you're too small for one position and, uh, not fast enough for another. I mean, there's always somewhere else you can put you. I mean, <laughs> there's enough defensive positions to go around, man, especially in the secondary or linebacker. So, well, he uh, pretty much plays uh, safety and linebacker with the majority of linebackers. So, but uh, it's a good good fit for him. Yeah, uh, Justin Holland. I was going to put this up here, but I think he forgot to mention. Uh, who he said? Can you speak on who Ethan Chris reminds you? Oh, reminds you of? Here we go. Sorry, I can't read because you know. Uh, does Ethan Chris remind you of anybody from previous Vandy teams? Uh, from the times I've been able to watch Chris, uh, he really 
does a good job in coverage. And, and you're talking about somebody with really good ball skills and that type. I, I know he plays linebacker and, you know, we talked about earlier how you want safety types to play linebacker so they can uh, run and do those things. Uh, that, that's what Crisp is. Uh, when, when he's in the seven on seven settings, he's dang good. He makes yeah. a ton of plays. Uh, if you watch him on film, like his junior year, which, you know, he only played one game as a senior. But if you watch his junior film, you know, and, and I watched a ton of Ethan Chris film, game film uh, as a junior. But uh, he made a ton of plays in the passing game. Uh, he's got a lot of range to him. He's really fast. Um, any, anything as far as, like, coverage skills, he, he he's really good at that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, just watching him up close at the Rivals camp back in the spring, I mean, that was probably the thing he excelled at the most. You know, you, you know, and he's really fluid too, you know, going through the linebacker drills and, and you right. know, kind of the one-on-one type stuff. But, yeah, one-on-one and, and pass coverage and going up against uh, running backs, I mean, he, he excelled at that and caught a lot of people's eyes. So, uh, yeah, I think that's probably one, one aspect of this game he can be really good at, just kind of dropping back and helping out in coverage situations. So, uh, that's not kind of seems to be his forte. So, um, so yeah, that's it for crisp. Anybody else you want to kind of hit on? I think we've talked a lot about the wide receivers for the most part. We've talked the running backs. Uh, you just mentioned O lineman. Anybody else you kind of want to hit on that we haven't so far? Well, really, the only guys is Jalen Gilbert, the safety out of Texas. Um, ex- Fast, you know, and, and that's the one thing we, we keep talking about that when we talk about skill guys, uh, you know, and I think Clark Lee and Barton Simmons, and I think they understood that they needed speed, but I think they really understood once they got in and inherited the roster that they did, that they really needed speed, you know, because all we heard about for six, seven years was length, 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 you know, and that, that's all <laughs> You know, you would go to camp down there and they wouldn't test or do anything like that, which, you know, I I get to a degree. You know, you you can't just base everything off of measurables. Some guys are good football players, don't have great measurables, you know, and there's some guys that have great measurables that aren't good football players. And it doesn't matter how well you coach them up and the things that you do, they're never going to be good football players. There are some like that. But to a degree – you have to have speed and, you know, especially in the South Eastern conference and, you know, in the secondary wise, it's made it really tough. And, you know, with Vanderbilt here recently with struggling with edge pressure, you know, cause those defensive ends are hard to find mm-hmm. uh, when you struggle with that. And then you have a tough time sending pressure because you want to keep two safeties back because you don't have enough speed on the back end. I mean, <clears throat> Put you between a rock and a hard place if you're a defensive coordinator. So uh, I think Vanderbilt's done a good job of trying to add as much speed as they could. Jalen Gilbert is one of those guys um, that's doing that. And we talk about the pass rush. Evan Herman is the uh, kid out of Wisconsin that they stole from Wyoming. And that's harsh, right, man. You got to say it like that. What's that? You know, stole them from stolen. <laughs> well. Okay, well, <laughs> got it from, he was previously committed to a fine institution known as Wyoming. Yeah, I know Chris. Are pretty I mean, cool. yeah, I mean, because, you know. And they got him from there, you know. Uh, and then Herman, you know, he he's a hurdler. You watch him in basketball. He's extremely athletic doing those things. But, you know, he's a guy that he's going to have to add weight and do those things to get – so you're not going to see his impact for a little bit. Just my opinion. Uh, right. You know, I'll say that he'll come out and be all freshman SEC next year. But uh, <laughs> and the, and the other guy that we haven't mentioned is uh, Duran Parrish, right in Mississippi. So, but who is a really good basketball player? And that's one thing that Barton is going to that he really likes, especially with uh, his skill kids. If you just go down through there and you look at a lot of those guys, they're multi-sport guys. They right. all play several things. And, you know, uh, 
you know, I'm a high school football coach, but we encourage our guys to play as many sports as you possibly can because the more you're being competitive, the the better it is for you. I mean, that's just that, that's what it is. And you get way too many athletes that are told, all right, you need to just play football from the time you're 11 year old on up. That's that's not the case. You know, you don't have to do that. We got a lot of questions coming in, uh, which is cool. So I appreciate the questions, guys. We're 40, about 45 minutes in. We have 16 people watching live. We had 17 at one point. I was going to pat ourselves on the back, and then it went down by one. So uh, so then I'm like, well, we're screwed. So anyway, <laughs> uh, so let me go through and uh, grab some questions here, and we'll uh, try to answer those. So uh, Jacob Kroon, appreciate the question. Uh, give us a like and a thumbs up down here at the bottom as well, guys, uh, that are on here right now. Uh, so he asked, guys, what is the roster – uh, still look thin or under talented at after the 23 class. What needs should be addressed? Should we see address going into the 2024 cycle? I'd imagine two QBs would be a possibility. Justin, what do you think about that? Well, when you're looking at it, is wherever you're thin or under talented, not only are you going to attack that in the 2024 class, but you're also going to attack that into the transfer portal. Right. So, you know, and, and they're going to add some guys. Uh, you know, they added to Cosmo, the mm -hmm. uh, transfer defensive end from from Stanford, and he's just going to be, you know, he, they're bringing him in for depth purposes. He right. flashed a little bit of being able to rush the passer, but you want an older guy that can, you know, help some of those others, you know, because you're still young at that defensive end position where they played, you know, uh, Dick Kite and uh, – a goo and some of those guys and you know they played well for for a true freshman in there that's that's not easy to do but uh tight end is definitely a position that you're going to have to attack um we even said kicker uh, earlier is a possibility kicker is a possibility as far as the transfer portal uh i do think that they get another defensive back as far as the transfer portal you know we talked about on our site how uh, alex Washington is going to come in for a <laughs> An official at one time, and they told him no. But, oh, okay. I guess I'll unpack then. <laughs> so, uh, so they're still going to – I think they're going to target that area. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> the other position is – and I'm not sure if they attack this in the portal or not. Sean, you can give your opinion on this. But, you know, losing Orgy, I don't think that was a surprise. I think they knew that was coming. Yeah. And, you know, think, what, what do you do linebacker wise? They, they, they got young linebackers, uh, but do you trust those guys uh, that you got coming back? Which, I mean, they got Kane Patterson. They got Ethan Barr. Both of them has played a ton of snaps. Mm -hmm. uh, you got Langston you Patterson got, coming out. Yeah. And then you got the young Patterson, Langston, that's yeah. going to be playing. And then you got uh, uh, the linebacker from Florida that we talked about the other day, Gillespie's teammate. What's his name? You got him as well. That's down there. God, I went blank. Blank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he's another one that's going to be in there. So I, I don't know if you uh, if you get one out of the transfer portal for that or not. But as as far as uh, twenty twenty four, you're definitely going to be looking for a quarterback. Because the chances are that you're going to keep those three quarterbacks in the same class, all right, and they're going to go on through, that ain't going to happen. Just like we talked about earlier, the majority of the guys that are in the uh, transfer portal are because they want more playing time. Right. So, uh, you know, you're, one of those guys eventually is going to do that. So you are going to have to get some quarterbacks. Um, you know, they've already been strong after offensive linemen. You know, mm -hmm. I think just as far as just – trying to improve the roster as much as possible. And the big thing to that is, is add more speed as much as possible. That is the key to what they got to have, especially defensively. And then, I mean, even offensively, that's the thing that they added in this class. And I think it's something that's going to help them out. Yeah. I mean, you know, when Lee took this job over, I mean, we knew that, you know, the roster needs some definite overalls. It's going to take time to do that. And, you know, they kind of addressed that defensive back wise last year with how many people they, you know, how many players they got in last year's class. And, you know, we've right. kind of seen, hey, look, DBs, they really need a lot more talent there. And, uh, you know, maybe they'll get a transfer guy, you know, here in, in a bit. But, you know, there's still a lot of positions of need. 
uh, in terms of depth and just adding quality players with speed and athleticism that uh, they can right. help get them better. Um, hang on here. Let's see. And the one positive, you know, and just like we talked about from the message board, the, the question that the guy put on there about uh, the offensive line recruiting, what Blazik walked into, offensive line room down there at Vanderbilt, I know a lot of people don't understand. It was not good. Like, <laughs> not good at what are you, all. What are you trying like, to say? I know he was sitting in there like, what in the world is going on around here? <laughs> You know, I, I just left, you know, North Dakota State, and then I left Wyoming, and then here I am, Southeastern Conference, here we go, and then he's probably looking around like. Did he Did he look at the depth chart and just just start uh, just start drinking old Milwaukee's in the, <laughs> in the office? <laughs> but, you know, to him, I mean, and this is, I mean, to all of them there, but, you know, he was able to, now we're looking at going into year three here. That's a position that's a strength going in. So, and you know, and that, that tells you a lot about what they've been able to do. You know, Russell Mondo did a really good job of identifying there with that class. Those guys are starting to go into their third year. Uh, so you start and you got Blazik, you know, his classes are starting to get in there and they're going. Uh, so, um, they, they did not recruit well up front for a few years and it definitely started to show and they started trying to get a couple of juco guys here and there to plug it in. Worked out. and it did not work out like they thought it was going to and then when blazett walked in he didn't walk into a good situation but you know if you just look at those guys that they're getting now they got the bodies that you need to play in the southeastern conference you know you can't be just little thin guys that can't put on weight, you know, just like we were talking about earlier, Cooper Starks and Mesa. Those are two guys that right now 320 plus. Right. You know, 320. I mean, they, 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 get, they got it the way that you need to. And, you know, they'll probably get bigger than what they are there once they get down there. You know, and they're not going to take guys that just – they're not going to go like Sam Pittman did when he was at Arkansas and, and Georgia and just – you know, sign dudes that weigh 375 pounds, okay? Because <laughs> that's what they did. We're just going to go as big as we possibly can. You know, they're not doing that, but they got the right body types at Vanderbilt, you know, to be successful. And you take people like Grayson Morgan, I think Leighton Nelson that they got last year, you just look at those guys and kind of what their build is, you know, that's there's a reason that that position is getting better. Yeah. I think uh, this person asked a good question. It's kind of a two-parter, so let me throw up the first one because he says, hey, guys, great to see your faces again. Awesome to be back on the live stream. We're back. And uh, <laughs> my, my question would be about uh, defensive front signees. Are these guys possible early contributors or maybe two years away? I think we kind of answered that a little bit earlier, but you can answer that again, Justin. I know we talked a lot about Demario Thomas. Yeah, I think Demario Thomas, I think he's got the ability that he could play early. You know, we just, like we've talked about, it's it's hard to do that in the Southeastern Conference. You know, uh, the big German defensive lineman that they had last year, uh, Otara, is that how you say it? I'm sure I'm butchering that up. The, Sounds uh, good to me, man. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, they got him. He was 20-year-old, mm -hmm. and so he was older. And, you know, it still was a, a struggle for him at times in there. But you can definitely look at him and tell he looks like a Southeastern Conference defensive lineman. Uh, and he's going to be good eventually. It's just it's tough on those young guys coming in, uh, playing against – you know, grown men, but Demarion Thomas, I mean, if he's legit close to 330 pounds and he moves like he does, then yeah, he's probably got a shot. Uh, uh, now the defensive lineman that they got from, uh, uh, kind of the same, kind of the same question, just so, yeah, uh, actually, uh, perk talk about perk. Will they bulk Gregory up to 300 to play nose tackle? So there's a, there's a relatively, uh, question right there along the defensive line. Yeah, well, uh, just watching his – and I told you this the other day, Sean. I watched him and, like, his film, like, actual film, uh, watching their live stream of one of their games. You know, he, he never came off the field. He was playing offense, offensive tackle, and then running around playing defense. And you could tell, you know, he's a good 290, 295, and they're playing pretty decent 
competition. You could tell from watching it. So uh, that's tough for any big person. You know, if you're, if you're that big and you play that many snaps, that's tough. Uh, so I was impressed with that. Uh, they already got him listed at 300. So uh, yeah. you know, I think we had him at 6'6", 280. And then he was actually 6'4", 300 out in the uh, – what Vanderbilt put out. So he's already there. I say, you know, they'll probably end up adding some weight to him. But that's, you know, that's, again, you trying to get the SEC type bodies. And the one thing that I like about him, and it's just the same point that I made about Sandoval and, and uh, Dante Kelly, he got offered by Rutgers. He's from New Jersey. So, you know, and they were able to see him. They liked him. They offered him. I always think that's a good sign. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's pretty impressive to have a guy at 300 pounds to play uh, both sides of the ball and just not leave the field. So, uh, yeah. Um, and this one is kind of correlated as well. You know, we talked about – you talked about Herman earlier, but, um, you know, how big will Herman need to get in your opinion? This is a question by Justin Holland. Appreciate the questions coming in, guys. Uh, that, that's a tough one. Well, the thing about him is, is his athleticism, uh, his ability to rush a passer is what you want. So however big he gets, you don't want him to lose that, whatever it is, you know, that could be, he could get up to two thirty and still be athletic and be able to move and, and do those things. And that'd be great. Or he could get up to two forty five and be able to do those things, you know, uh, if you look at, you know, throughout the years, you know, like Broderick Stewart, he was always, you know, he was he was pretty thin. Uh, Walker May, he was pretty thin there at times, uh, you know. So I, I, I'm not 100% sure there. I would say he's going to have to gain weight. You know, you can't play it. 210 pounds out there that's not going to go well for you. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, so, uh, but – I would say at least 230 and probably needs to uh, – and could probably go more than that. Yeah, and uh, maybe the best question so far um, – <laughs> who has the best cast in the class. <laughs> and that's a great question. I mean, uh, it depends on what you're looking for here. And uh, Justin, who has the best, who do you think has the best calves in the class? Well, I'm upset that I did not ask Clark Lee about calf definition <laughs> <laughs> at the press conference. Look, I mean, uh, and the fact that he had never met me before, and if that would have been my first question to him. That would have been pretty impressive. He really yeah, never hey, uh, Coach, uh, could you tell me who's got the best calf definition? <laughs> look, uh, yeah, that would be uh, good. I, I mean, look, I mean, they test these guys at, at camp. So, I mean, I'm, you're probably going to have to go with somebody at camp this summer because, you know, they, they do the, the speed agility test. I mean, they're really particular. I'm, I'm sure they looked at calf definition during that uh, process. Uh, 100% people are going to look at calf <laughs> <laughs> But I can tell you, I have not seen all of them's calves, so there is zero shot I could give you a good answer. There could possibly be somebody on staff that just watches calves as they come into the building and be like, man, look at the calves on that guy. 621, there we go. <laughs> you think they write it down in a little notebook? Yeah, best calves, you know. And then best calves. They just pass it off to Bart and be like, hey, look at these calves on these guys. <laughs> You know, offensive line, defensive line, though, it's kind of different, you know, because, you know, those are big calves, you know. I don't know how well defined <laughs> they would be. Well, that's uh, what I was thinking to say. If you're going by biggest calves, I would probably say Misa <laughs> might have the biggest calves. Be yeah, but, I, you know, if you're going by – That's not, that's not uh, best calves. That's just biggest calves. Yeah, biggest calves. I'd say maybe most defined calves would probably be uh, – I mean, I, I would probably go with – Junior Cheryl, just because he he's all, <laughs> runs all over the place and he you know he's all over well, the field. Yeah, so. to be a fast guy. <laughs> London <laughs> Humphreys could he be in that category there? Big track guy, so yeah, I, I would say Evan so. Herman can jump really well. What about That's true? Yeah, yeah. There's some there's some power in those calves, so yeah. yeah. I mean, that's probably that's probably our uh, our biggest guys right there. I mean, I would say the track guys are probably going to have the best calves, best looking right. calves. And then, you know, if you and want to go as a hurdler, so that helps him in that too. Right. So. And then if you want to go, you know, just massive calves, I mean, that would probably be uh Misa Sandoval. So yeah, I know Misa on that one. All, All right, right, man. You gotta think Cooper Starks might be able to get him run for money or something. Uh, shot putter, yeah. 
That's, yeah. a good, that's a good point, man. Uh, <laughs> best calves. All right. Uh, great question. Uh, all right. Justin Holland ha hits us with another question. Uh, how would you rate the job the strength and conditioning program is doing with these recruits? It's a really good question because, you know, we've talked a lot about the strength and conditioning program under Mason. And uh, what do you, how do you think the, those guys are doing right now with uh, Clark Lee at the helm? Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell right now. I think we'll get a better idea of that in the spring because, you know, the first class that Lee brought in, he really didn't recruit any of those guys. Right. That was just the previous class that was already there. He did do a good job of trying to keep some of those guys in, like C.J. Taylor. Uh, this last <laughs> class, you know, uh, Grayson Morgan's one of those guys. You know, that that's the type of guy that you want to see what type of jump he makes. Right. Because you know, he come in, you know, and you did one of his games when he was in high school. He was probably what at that time? 250? Uh, maybe, yeah. I'd have to go yeah, back. Yeah, maybe. I can't think off the top of my head. But, yeah, he was pretty light, though. Yeah. And then, you know, he probably played at 260 this year. So, and he's playing interior, playing center, uh, and did really well at that time. But you're you want to see what type of jump that he makes. And I, and I think you'll be able to see that a whole lot more this spring. I think you'll, we'll all get a better idea of that. Right. All right. We got another question coming in. Yeah. Hit the like button. That's something I need to uh, kind of keep mentioning on here. Hit our, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we're over a thousand subscribers on this Vandy sports YouTube channel. Uh, big thanks to Chris Lee. Hopefully we don't uh, lose subscribers because we're our ugly mugs are on this talking about recruiting right now. So that's, that's our only hope that we don't go below this a thousand. This might be our last one. Be our first yeah. <laughs> and last. Chris, Chris, Chris will log in and be like, dang it, we only got 900 subs now. Uh, I think we're going to bring you guys back. <laughs> All right. Uh, appreciate the questions. Uh, it, this isn't as good as the calf question, but it's pretty close. But uh, this question to Justin, what is your thoughts on how Lee and Bart are doing with in-state recruiting? Great question. Well, they signed five from the state. Uh, they got in on several others that, you know, they had a shot at getting, you know, like Luke Brown, the offensive lineman out of Henry County. That was one that they, you know, had a pretty decent shot at at one time. Um, I think they're doing a tremendous job. Um, I've talked about, you know, how <clears throat> in the past, you know, hasn't always been great, but, uh, Clark Lee and them have definitely did a good job of extending the olive branch there to all of, you know, all of those in Tennessee, as far as, you know, practices coming down, they, they try to do a free uh, coaching clinic at one time for everybody to come down and do those things. They're constantly around. Uh, they encourage you to come down there as much as you possibly can. Uh, the, they always have an open door to your high school coaches. And, you know, and the other thing that I brought up as well is one of the good things that they're doing is they're being the first to offer for some of these guys in right. state, you know, and they're not afraid to go out there and say, all right, we, I trust it. This guy can play. I'm going to go ahead and offer him. And it may be a guy that's a freshman or sophomore. And then when you read about it, you're like, it's going to be three years for I got to care about this. I ain't worried about it, you yeah. know, because that, that's natural reaction. That's just how it is. But Sometimes you got to do that to get in the game with some of these guys. And also, right. too, your coaches, they appreciate that. Hey, you know, Vanderbilt was able to come out on the limb here and go ahead and offer my guy so I don't have to sit around and just constantly push and push and push trying to get guys to, uh, to look at my prospects so they'll come in and, you know, offer him. If they're the first ones to do that, it makes that a whole lot easier. So um, I think Lee and them have done a really good job, especially with your coaching staffs uh just uh around the state trying to get in with those and and doing those things so yeah i agree i mean you're seeing a lot of in-state guys especially in the 25 and even 26 classes i've seen them dish out yes. a couple of 26 offers you're two or three um and they they're dishing out offers to those guys or the you know vanderbilt's their first offer they're going to remember that you know and right. and you know they and you know and they're not just dishing out offers they're actually offering them while they're on a visit so, you know, that right. makes it even more important, you know, and it makes it even more special when you get offered while you're on a visit, uh, you know, instead of just having a phone call, especially with the in-state kids, you know, you want to kind of, Absolutely. you know, you want to know the program and then when they offer you, you're going to always remember that and that's going to help you build a good relationship with those guys. So Right. And that's the thing, you know, and this ain't an in-state kid, but Martel Hyde, 
Vanderbilt was the first to ever offer for Martell Hyatt. Mm-hmm. You know, first uh, visit that he went on Vanderbilt. You know, and that always stuck with him. Martell Hyatt got offered by all kinds of people. Right. You know, really good schools, but he knew in the back of his mind, hey, Vanderbilt's first one in on me. So hey, look that. That usually look that didn't work out for Kamari and Pimpton, but it did work out for Martel Hyatt. You're not going to win them all, you know. So you're right, yeah. you you going to win bad there, you know. So, right, yeah. and that, that's the thing too. And I know people get upset with it, you know. And James Franklin, he did a really good job of getting some highly rated in-state kids, you know, because a lot of times if you're going to get a four star or something like that, some sometimes it's just going to be a kid that wants to stay close to home, you know. Sometimes that's the easiest route to get those guys, and but. Also, too, in-state recruiting, and it's just like it's everywhere. They they know the program more than anybody else. You know, a lot of times, you know, and me and you, we, we've encountered this. Some kid to get offered by Vanderbilt three weeks before signing day. Hey, what do you like about Vanderbilt? Well, I don't really know. I'm just kind of learning about it right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, he's in there Googling at the time. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know? Well, if you're some kid from Brentwood or – you know, you're some kid from Lebanon or you're some kid from, you know, right. wherever, you know, you know about Vanderbilt. You've probably been to their campus a few times. You've seen their football program. You know, you you know about those things. And sometimes that hurts you a little bit with, with those um, in that scenario. But the more in-state kids that you get, the better shot that you have of getting those others – and, you know, they can rally around, hey, you know, we're playing for Nashville. We're doing those things. And, uh, you know, it's, it, to me, it's a positive. <clears throat> and it gives you a connection with the city of Nashville, the state of Tennessee. And, uh, you know, I, I just it, there's a lot of positives for Vanderbilt and also for the state of Tennessee high school football. So. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, you know, you've seen a lot of kids. They're getting a lot of kids on campus. Like I said, a lot of younger kids too. You know, kids that, where the recruiting process hasn't even started yet, or maybe the Kickstarter is a Vanderbilt offer. You know, so they they know a lot about these kids. Getting them on campus, getting them familiar with the the next step's going to be going to a bowl game. Yes, getting competitive against Tennessee. Look, I mean, right, look. and that, that's the one thing I was going to say. You know, the the finish there. Was not that, good. Did not help, especially yeah. your in-state kids, you know, because that, that was one that they were paying attention to. Yeah, it, right? it would be different if it was like, you know, you show a little bit of life, it's, you know, 35 to, you know, 20 or something like that. You right. fall a little bit, you know. But, yeah, just to, to lose like that and not put any points on the board and just look like you're completely right. out of class was not, not the best finish. But, you know, they're almost there. And, you know, I think everybody – you know, if you took a poll, everybody's going to say that Vanderbilt's on the right trajectory and in, in what Absolutely. they're doing, and they definitely, uh, they definitely achieved some big things this year. Uh, the next step for them is just getting to that six-win plateau, going to a bowl game, and then you know, making some noise and being competitive against you know teams like Tennessee. You know, they're a big in-state rival at the end of the year. So right, and and the thing about it is, you know, Vanderbilt had beat Kentucky and Florida. Me and you, you know, we cover recruit, we talk to these kids. That definitely helped. Yeah. I helped them with Diego Benson and some of those guys because right. you, you can say whatever you want. Hey, you know, vision, 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 vision. With the first class, you can get by with that. You know, th- those kids buy into that. But coming into this class right here, you're recruiting off of going two and ten the year before. Right. You know, so it, it changes that. So you're 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 not. It's hard for you to say vision, 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 and. You know, kids. You have kids to have you have to have tangible evidence at that point. Yeah. Well, you just went two and ten. What kind of vision <laughs> is that? You know, and that, that's kind of the thought process there of some of those kids. It makes it tough. But when you beat Florida and Kentucky, and then you know you get there and you you got one game away from being bowl eligible, possibly. Uh, you know, that, that changes things a little bit. And when you're talking about Tennessee, it was a disappointing end. But yeah. uh, it was a bad matchup for what right. the, the style that Vanderbilt played this year was a bad matchup because yeah. uh, they they stopped the run they couldn't stop the pass Vanderbilt struggled with the pass and could run the football so uh, it made it really difficult and Vanderbilt's defense I thought played pretty good in the first half they only gave up fourteen points uh, but if you're on the field constantly 
it's really hard for you to be good defensively. Yeah, it's going to catch up to you eventually. Right. Uh, Perk asks a really good question. We're talking. We're sitting here talking about you know future in-state kids. Uh, George McIntyre uh, in 2025, could he be the highest-rated Vandy recruit if he commits? I, that's a good question. I mean, he'll he's going to be up there, no doubt. Um, you know, he's already got a lot of offers from some big time programs, but he really likes Vanderbilt too. And it, that's another kid that Vanderbilt's done a really good job of getting in on early, making a good impression. Obviously, he's got <laughs> close family ties to the program. That really does help. But, uh, you know, just talking to him, um, I talked to him toward the end of his season uh, after I went to his playoff game. And he's like, man, I really like what coach lee and and all them are doing over there it's like they really kind of feel like family so that's a really good impression for him obviously a long way to go but you know quarterbacks usually make their decisions early you know so uh, if you can uh kind of hang in there like i said once again if vanderbilt can show progress get to that six plus win plateau and go to a bowl game i think that's going to be very important you know uh going into that 2025 class and you know if you can land a guy like him uh, that would be a huge uh, that would be a huge game changer and it would create a ton of buzz in the recruiting world if you can get a guy like him to uh, to enter your class and be a be a spokesperson going forward there. Right, and that's the thing about it. Those quarterbacks, you know, quarterback recruiting is different than everything else because most other positions are going to take two to four or five, depending on what position you play. Quarterbacks usually they're taking one, and uh, so those guys have to take their spot as quickly as they possibly can. Right. And usually, you know, that's why people see them as the leaders of the class. You know, you're talking about recruiting some in-state guys. If you've got someone like McIntyre in there, that at the caliber of player that he is, then you're talking about it, you can absolutely set the tone for um, that class. But like you said, you know, you got to continue to see improvement on the field. That's going to be the biggest thing for the future. You know, I think they're going to be able to sell to the 24 class pretty easily just for the sake of going five and seven this past year. And you can right. see the, the improvement, you know, what you got to do is you got to con- continue that. And I do think the roster as a whole is getting better. Right. Getting and better. It's, it's thing- young. It's young. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, sometimes that's – you, you got to go through some growing pains there. But it, it's young, but it's more talented. So. I think the thing with McIntyre, and I, I sit here and say, you know, usually quarterbacks commit early. But a guy like McIntyre, he's probably going to be very highly rated. He's going to have a lot of options. He's probably going to be one of those guys who can probably wait, <laughs> to be honest with you. So you have to kind of juggle with that as well. But I think, you know, he's a really smart – He's a really smart kid. He knows how it works. You know, his his dad played football. His uncle coaches football. You know, uh, he knows how all this stuff works. So I, I think he would be a kid that would probably commit to a school pretty early. Uh, you know, I think he's going to take his visits, and he'll probably know and uh, kind of be that uh, leader of a recruiting class. He kind of kind of gives off that vibe. So uh, be a, that would be a big gift for Vanderbilt, obviously. So we'll see what happens. We got another question coming in from Tyler Bishop. Appreciate you uh, chiming in here. As a Tennessee fan, I was impressed with Vandy. They had a heck of a season, way better than most expected. Bad match versus the balls. Plus, Tennessee was pissed off after the USC loss. Yeah, that probably happened, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what happened. I do agree yeah. with that. Yeah, the, the Missouri game was one that they could have won. South Carolina, honestly, is one that they could have had yeah. something. You know? yep. But they said that that's one of the things that catapult, catapulted them late in the season there is because they were disappointed after that South Carolina loss because they thought they should have played better. So Yeah, exactly. Well, with that being said, that is all the questions we have answered on here. Is there any uh, I might have missed on the message board, or did we get all those? Uh, one of them was about in-state recruiting. Okay. Covered that. Uh, he was talking about on there about the, the difference between middle East and West. I, you know, I honestly, I don't think that's really that big of a difference as far as, you know, recruiting between those, and, you know, AJ Newberry did live in Memphis until he was 10 year old. So you might be able to count him as a Memphis guy. So you can have <laughs> So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll conspicuously put that on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they did get one West Tennessee guy. And then they, uh, the other one was talking about the offensive line recruiting from the past compared to what, okay. it, what it is yeah. now. And then covered yeah. that. You know, just yeah. how Russell Mondo 
you know, everybody has said that he did a fantastic job in his one class that he brought in. And as we saw this year, I mean, they, they, they made an impact this year. Yeah. And then you talk about, you know, what Blazik's brought in so far, you know, which we haven't really seen a ton of that because, you know, this is only his second class. You usually don't play a bunch of young linemen. So, but you can tell that they're getting the, the, the body types that they need. Yeah. Anything else you want to hit on, or otherwise we'll uh, we'll end this. We've been going an hour and fifteen minutes now, so. No, Pretty man, uh, that's about it. Just uh, get on Bandy Sports, come join us. Uh, we got some really good posters on there. In addition to, you know, me and you writing and stuff. You know, we're we're okay at times, but uh, we got some good posters on there. Like people that actually know football and those things. And you know, if you, if you're a huge Vanderbilt fan. There is absolutely no better place to get on there and talk about Vanderbilt sports. That's for sure. Uh, Chris Lee does a heck of a job as far as like game recaps and constantly on everything as, uh, as much as he is. So, uh, so if you couldn't join us, uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. VandySports.com. It's where you can find us. Uh, sign up to a subscription. Obviously uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll try to put a lot more stuff on our YouTube channel now that we have, now that we're big ballers and we have over a thousand subscribers, uh, we can start getting those uh, those six dollar uh, monetized checks every month. You know, I'd help I'd help pay Justin to crank out some stories. That's yeah, six dollars would go a long way. <laughs> uh, we do have uh, Chuck Woods ask us about uh, what do you think of the new running back coach? I haven't done a lot of research on him yet, so uh, I know he's coming from Tulsa. So I mean. Maybe t- I think he's got some ties and probably recruits Texas pretty well. I mean, where did they get all three of the running backs uh, this past year? So That is correct. From the state of Texas. Yep. And uh, that, that's another thing I put in one of the stories. They had uh, five players from Texas this year. Uh, that equaled the amount of in-state kids. Hey, that's so. we talked about, though. Newberry, you could about count him as Texas. Well, yeah, so, we can move. Six we can, and four up there. So. You know, you can kind of split them between Texas and Tennessee on Newberry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Split down the middle. But no, I, the, I do think that the, the Texas connections there, um, you know, but Vanderbilt for them to be successful, and, and they know this. I mean, but you're always going to have to hit Georgia, Alabama, yeah, Florida, Mississippi, Tennessee. They I mean, that's where, that's where you're going to get the meat of what you got. You know, Louisiana, some of those places. But they did go out of that five-hour radius though, and, and hit Texas a bunch. This yes, season. they did. But, <laughs> Guys like AJ Newberry and uh, Diego Benson, uh, Cedric Alexander. I mean, yeah, you're you're not going to give those. You, you're going to get after those guys. So right. Hey, uh, with we'll that being said, we appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. We got up to I think 17, 18 viewers at one point. So we really appreciate that. We didn't really know what to expect doing a live stream here. So you know, if you guys didn't catch the live stream, you, obviously you can go back and watch it on the the Vandy Sports YouTube channel. So Appreciate you guys. Uh, give us some feedback, uh, not only here in the comments after we're done, how we did, but also on our message board at VandySports.com. And with that being said, Justin Angel is back. Appreciate the time. Sean, Sean yeah. Williams. We'll see you guys later. Have a good night.